The Xperia is Energica's foray into the sports tour world. After releasing the Eco, Eva Rebele and SAS9 to market over recent years, the company has clearly taken the decision to target the section of the market which is perhaps a little less glamorous but which places function firmly over form. Most motorcyclists are very much road riders, not track day enthusiasts or circumnavigators of the world. And while adventure bikes have been in high demand for over a decade, there's clearly a demand among motorcyclists for more offerings which reflect common usage road riding. For those who enjoy motorcycle touring journeys, myself included, the Xperia looks set to fulfil precisely that role. It's just my luck then that this new offering from Energica was released shortly after I took delivery of my Eva Rebele at the close of April 2022. As they say, it's all in the timing. The English Electric Motor Company, or EEMC, and Energica UK held a press day and open day at the start of August for riders to come and experience the Xperia for themselves. I was invited to the event but unfortunately couldn't make it due to family holiday commitments. However, by chance, three of the Xperia bikes remained with EEMC for a few more days. And, by happy coincidence, I had a visit there planned to have a rain guard fitted to my Ribelle. And so, on the 30th of August, coincidentally exactly one year since I had test ridden the Eva Ribelle for the first time, I made the journey to EEMC on another unusually hot English summer day. And while my rain guard was fitted, I had my first Xperia... experience. I'll talk through the main specifications of the Xperia in this video and I'll put a link in the description to an info page, so feel free to take a look at the linked page for more details. A quick tour of the controls to begin with then, which are the same as those on other Energica models. On the right side we have the red motor start and kill switch, and above these the cruise control switch with the set button above it, which can be used in conjunction with the mode switch on the left handlebar to adjust the cruise control speed when cruise control is engaged. Unfortunately, as with previous models, the cruise control switch is too far away from the throttle to reach with the right hand thumb and is directly above the motor kill switch, with all the predictable fun which follows when you try to engage cruise control and your thumb slips down to the kill switch. On the top of the bar is the control for heated grips, where these are fitted. Moving to the left handlebar, from the bottom up we have the horn, the indicator and hazard warning switch, keep the indicator switch held to engage the hazard lights, and multi-purpose mode switch above. On the front side are the headlight controls. Main beam is of course active all the time. Pull back to flash the high beam or flick the switch forward to stay on high beam and pull back to return to main beam. The Xperia possesses a slightly bigger 5 inch TFT display than its predecessors, which has a slightly more polished looking font and at the time of my test ride was set up so that all the standard information you want is displayed on a single screen. Missing however were the other info screens which exist on the other models and provide information on current journey, historical and real time efficiency figures. I'm reliably informed that there is still work to be done on the bike's software, so hopefully the information available on those screens will be added in the finished article. There are rumours that Energica are considering adding bespoke navigation into the bike's software. I'll come on to that shortly. To start the bike, once powered on, pull back the front brake lever and press the motor start switch. The bike running light is illuminated on the bike's display. Different from the current Energica models, the mode switch is used to move between selection of riding mode, regenerative braking mode, trip and main menu choices, all from the one screen. I have to say, I prefer the way the riding and regen modes are set on the existing models by pressing the set button on the front of the left handlebar with the left index finger and entering a custom screen where these, along with ABS, can be set. On the Xperia, the riding and braking modes are set on the main screen, meaning there are potentially more presses of the mode switch to reach and set the option you want. Regarding the bike's main menu, from the settings menu you can configure the main options of the bike. You push the mode switch left and right to reach the relevant setting, then press to confirm. Clock allows you to set the preferred time format and set the time. The set button, accessed with the left index finger on the front of the left handlebar, exits the current menu. 
Connectivity is used to activate Bluetooth, connect to a phone so that you can use the Energica phone app, and remove any current Bluetooth pairing. As with other models, the bike is available with keyless start, and the keyless section of the menu allows you to change the PIN code where this is activated, allowing the bike to be started with a PIN, and no active or passive key present. The chronometer allows you to display and log completions of a circuit or similar. This feature is absent from my Evo Rebelle, but from what I can see it was on earlier generations of Energica bikes. The charge menu allows you to set the state of charge limit, so you might set this, for example, to 80% to maximise longevity of the battery's life. There's no reason to be overly worried about charging to 100%, and indeed it's recommended to do so every month or so to balance the battery. But it's widely known as best practice not to leave a battery at too high or too low a charge rate for a long time. LPR, or long period rest mode, is used to maintain the battery when the bike is not used for prolonged periods. From the diagnostic menu, you can check vehicle status, which reports any error codes. In the case of this demo bike, it's reporting a P1040, which, as far as I can tell, is a charger fan open circuit fault. As mentioned, this isn't the finished bike and there are clearly tweaks to be done. The service menu displays distance or date by which the next service is due. The bike has a waterproof frunk on top of what would be the fuel tank on a conventional bike. However, there was an issue with the particular bike I was riding and this didn't work. In any event, this is a small storage area but would certainly be sufficient to store a phone and a few other smaller items and rather nicely, it incorporates a couple of USB ports in addition to the two in the cockpit area, as per the previous models. The other nice development on the Xperia over previous models is the shift in the position of the charge port. This has been moved from under the seat to under a panel on the right hand side of the bike, just around where your right knee sits while riding. Unfortunately I neglected to film this myself, mainly because I didn't use it, and was enjoying myself too much to remember to do so but it comprises the now standard European CCS charge socket, combining AC Type 2 and DC charging in one socket. The repositioning of this from under the seat is really a welcome move. Interestingly, there's no obvious locking pin override mechanism near the socket from what I can see, so that does make me question whether the locking pin attenuator issues experienced on the other models has definitely been resolved, or there is a different mechanism for this. As with its Energica siblings, the bike benefits from DC rapid charging, which will see you up and running in probably around 40 minutes. As I didn't see the bike charging, I didn't get a chance to see the charge settings, but a useful feature on the other bikes in the range is the ability to set the charging speed. So you can, for instance, lower the amps when charging from a domestic socket if you want to minimise the load on a socket, or at a rapid charge point if you want to maintain a lower battery temperature while on a longer ride. If you haven't already seen it, take a look at my video of my Energica ride with James Coates recreating my electric motorcycle ride from the bottom to the very top of the UK mainland in one ride, and then beyond that to the top of Shetland to see what I mean about that. Mounting the bike, first impressions were the height of the bike before me, with the raised tank and screen area offering great protection against the wind in a more comfortable upright position compared to my Ribelle. Something else noticeable was that despite the overall height of the bike, and the seat height being taller, it was possible for me to flat foot the bike more easily than on the Ribelle. The Ribelle's seat height is 790mm and the Xperia's seat height is 847mm, a full 57mm or 2.24 inches higher. And yet it was easier for me to flat foot the Xperia, so there's something in the seat shape and or width going on. This was an opinion shared by the folk at English Electric too. In terms of the bike's weighting, I honestly have no issues with the weighting on the Rebelle, but the Xperia has further benefited from some weight transfer around the bike, with the motor and battery position lower still than on the other models in the range. I have to say, Energic have come a long way in a very short number of years. The bikes used to be far more noticeably top heavy, but that is no longer the case at all. The bike weighs in at 260 kilograms, which is identical to my 2022 Rebelle, but it feels even more flickable, even when stationary due to low weight distribution. A further evolution in the bike's motor has seen another decrease in its weight. 
My 2022 Ribelis EMCE motor was 10 kilograms lighter than the previous motor design, and the Xperia's motor is lighter still. The motor now produces 115 newton meters, or 85 foot pounds of torque, with a peak power of 75 kilowatts, or 102 horsepower. Compared with the 215 newton meters, or 159 foot pounds, and peak power of 126 kilowatts, or 169 horsepower, on the Ribelle. However, this is more than adequate, as anyone who rides it can attest. And the payoff, combined with the slightly larger battery capacity of 22.5 kilowatt hours, of which 19.6 kilowatt hours is usable, is an extended combined range, that is to say on mixed roads, of around 160 miles. I have to say, in my experience, the combined range quoted by Energica is pretty accurate for standard riding on mixed roads, so the Xperia adds a little under 20 miles extra range over the Ribelle through its slightly tamer motor and extra 0.7 kWh usable battery capacity. Oh, and the battery is lighter too. The battery itself has a life expectancy to 80% capacity of 1200 cycles, quoted at 100% DOD or depth of discharge. In other words, after the equivalent of 1200 full to empty discharge cycles, you can still expect to have 80% of the battery capacity remaining. This is the same as the other Energica bikes, but if 1200 cycles doesn't sound many, you'd be looking at 23 years if you depleted the equivalent 100% of the battery once a week, and you'd still have 80% capacity left. 0 to 60 miles per hour or 0 to 100 kilometers per hour speed is 3.5 seconds. Top speed is limited to 112 miles per hour or 180 kilometers per hour, but you shouldn't be doing those kind of speeds for legal reasons in most countries and for efficiency reasons on de-restricted stretches of the autobahn. For that job, and for the would-be power rangers among you, you most likely want the Eco. Now taking a look around the bike, the front and rear wheels are cast aluminium, or aluminium for our lower scoring Scrabble friends across the pond, and are 3.5 by 17 inches on the front and 5.5 by 17 inches on the rear. Both wheels are fitted with Pirelli Scorpion Trail 2 tyres. The frame is a tubular trellis with aluminium side plates and the swing arm is cast aluminium. In a departure from its siblings, front and rear suspension is by ZF Zachs with 43mm diameter and 150mm travel, adjustable preload, extension and compression on the front forks, and the rear mono has rebound and preload adjustment. Brakes are by Brembo, with twin 330mm four-piston caliper discs on the front, and a 240mm two-piston caliper disc on the rear. Now, coming back to the apparent consideration to add onboard navigation, I appreciate that many may well disagree with me here, but here are my thoughts on that idea. There is absolutely no reason any automotive manufacturers should continue to reinvent the wheel and to include bespoke navigation systems into vehicles now, when phone apps or dedicated GPS units do a much better job. Tesla may be an exception here, but only because it essentially uses Google Maps. For some time, I've been frustrated that motorcycles continue to lag behind cars in terms of adoption of Android Auto and Apple CarPlay which were introduced almost a decade ago. But I am pleased that Honda and Harley-Davidson have incorporated both Android Auto and Apple CarPlay into some of their models. Recent Honda Goldwing and Africa Twin bikes, along with the new NT1100 Sports Tourer, all include both systems, and credit to Honda for doing so. Bespoke manufacturer-specific navigation is invariably suboptimal, since it's inflexible, often doesn't include live traffic information, and doesn't provide access to a wealth of other enabled and constantly updated apps in the same way that Android Auto and Apple CarPlay can. And then when it comes to updating maps, a process rendered redundant when using live mapping software such as Google Maps with a cellular connection, the owner is invariably offered a map update for a not insignificant fee. The Nissan Leaf, now in the ownership of our daughter, has never had its navigation updated simply because I refuse to pay the extortionate fees to update maps when my Garmin Zumo and Google Maps are updated at no cost. Consequently, the Leaf is stuck with maps from 2013, essentially rendering it a wholly useless feature. Rather than use the in-car navigation, she uses her phone on a dash mount for navigation, 
offering live and far more accurate maps with live traffic information. In our MG ZS CV, I use Android Auto, which is rendered on the car's infotainment screen, the whole point of the system. For longer motorbike trips and tours, I still use a dedicated Garmin Zumo XT GPS, but that's because it's very powerful for planning longer trips. However, in cases where you're travelling from A to B, Google Maps or any number of other navigation apps, Waze or Apple Maps, can meet that need perfectly well. I no longer see any bespoke navigation software as a positive selling point at all. Quite the opposite in fact. So my vote would go for Android Auto and Apple CarPlay to be incorporated into the Energica range. I appreciate that this is not in the least bit likely to happen in the near future, but maybe we'll see it in a model down the line. In the meantime, this may all be academic anyway. Maybe Energica haven't integrated GPS navigation into the final bike at all. As with the previous models, there are six levels of traction control and the four riding modes which exist on the previous models. Sport, Urban, Rain and Eco. However, unlike with the previous Energica models, there are three additional customizable riding modes. It wasn't immediately obvious how these are configured from flicking through the menus, so either that functionality is yet to be incorporated into the bike's operating system, or such configuration is done via the Energica phone app. The slow reverse and forward modes are available, as per the other Energica models, and I can speak from some experience of owning my Everibele now, that I've found these very useful on occasion. When you're wielding a 260kg lump between your legs, these modes can be a blessing. Warranty is 2 years on the vehicle, and 3 years or 50,000 kilometres on the battery. Servicing details are to emerge at the time I'm putting this together, but I would guess that the maintenance schedule is as kind on the wallet as with the more recent versions of its siblings. Although the Xperia I rode here didn't have the luggage fitted, the bike is advertised with the luggage, including hard panniers and top box with a combined capacity of 112 litres. Now at this point, I want those of you watching and thinking that this bike isn't suitable for touring to think a little and consider things sensibly. I know that some of you are going to tell me that unless an electric motorbike will do 250 miles without you needing to stop to charge, you're not interested. We'll leave aside the fact that the average petrol bike won't do that kind of range and talk reality. For many years I've toured all over the UK and around mainland Europe. I've always used GPS units when touring and consequently all my journeys have been logged. A few months ago I was keen to establish what my average daily mileage had been on touring trips. And when I say touring trips, I mean touring trips. When I've toured by motorbike, it hasn't been merely a means of transport to necessarily go and visit things. The purpose of the holiday has been to ride a motorbike. The route has been the determining factor, the day dedicated primarily to riding, and visits to nice locations have been because they've been en route or nearby. And have a guess at what my average daily mileage has been on such trips. I'll tell you. Typically between 150 and 250 miles, or 240 and 400 kilometres. Those have been full days with standard brakes on a petrol bike. It's fair to say that these have been on fun alpine roads for the main part, outside the necessary stretches of motorway to get to and from the mountains. But one thing I learned the hard way many years ago was to plan a day's ride by time and not distance. If you plan five to six hours ride on a GPS route, that's going to be a day's worth of riding, and if it's on interesting roads, as I've established, you're looking at between 150 and 250 miles. A 150 mile day could probably be done without charging. A 250 mile day would need a charge stop somewhere, ideally at a coffee stop. But with CCS on board, the bike will have added more than enough range before you've even finished your café und Kuchen. I'd just plan a charge stop into the day with a coffee stop, and you're sweet. Arrange it so you can plug into a standard power socket, or even better, an AC EV charge point at your overnight accommodation, and you're laughing. No doubt, anyone investing in an Energica is paying a premium for being an early adopter. But for that, you're getting beautifully designed and crafted, cutting-edge technology. Sure, it's a premium price, but it's for a premium product. Naturally, that isn't going to sway the already cynical, but even among my own circle of biker friends and acquaintances, 
This is the first Energica model where some have expressed serious interest and a desire to try it out. And if I were in the market for a new electric motorbike now, I'd have to give the Xperia serious consideration. Thanks to its combination of riding comfort, ease of handling, slightly longer range and luggage options. As it is though, I'll be staying with my Eva Ribelle, as it's proven itself perfectly happy to do silly long journeys and frankly, despite my preference for function over form, I have to say, to my eyes, the Ribelle is a better looking bike. As always, thanks for watching. Please remember to like and subscribe if you've enjoyed the video and I hope to bring you more electric motorcycle fun soon. <laughs>